I'm really happy to be here today with Sherry Harkins from, um, let's see, you're from the Northeast. Yep. Someplace. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you're an artist. And uh, I saw your uh, wonderful conversation with Paul Vanderclay this morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm going to tell everybody who's watching if they want to know a lot about you that they can go to the the story that's on Paul Vanderclay's channel, which I will link to in the description so that you and I today can just get started talking about art. Sounds great. So um, as I mentioned before we started, I thought it might be fun to have you sort of interrogate me a little bit about my process. <clears throat> so I was going to show you one particular painting where I, I don't typically do a good job of um, keeping track of what I'm doing on a painting, but there was one particular painting where I, I photographed many of the steps during the process. And so I mm -hmm. thought it might be fun to talk our way through that one. I would love that. I'm very interested, having heard you speak often about the elements and principles and how those have uh, been so meaningful to you and thinking about your work, I am very excited to hear about what you have to say. Okay, well, let's see if we can <clears throat> get this going. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to share screen and <clears throat> okay so can you see that i can so um i just i had to put some sort of a title on the file mm -hmm. for the um slideshow and so i just called it progression because it's the progression of this particular painting so I typically start out with an, an underlay of color and many times it'll just be maybe an underlay of all different oranges or an underlay of all different blues. In this particular painting, I started out with a wild and crazy underlay of color and uh, trying to create some chaos for myself. So this was step one. So, um, I look at it for a while, I turn it upside down, I step back and I try to see what I see there. And I had done in a drawing class, I had done some drawings of this female figure. And so I thought, well, it'd be kind of fun to overlay her onto this. So uh, step two is here. I overlaid the female figure on and, and just knocked back some of the background. Mm -hmm so that I could find her in the midst. And somehow, some way, this guy showed up in the background here. And then this guy showed up in the background here. And I decided I didn't really like that. It, it felt too distracted. Um, first of all, I had lost a lot of the interest in the background, because one of the things I go for is to try to get the background and foreground to play with each other, mm -hmm. so that so that even though the edges are there to show you the figure, when you first look, you might you might just have a moment where like, where's the background, where's the foreground? And, and I felt like this was a little bit too precise in some ways. And so I wanted to kind of move on from there. So I wanted to get rid of this guy and this guy. So I came no, in I step three. And in step three, hmm. I just kind of did a wash over the whole thing with a lighter color. And uh, and then once I did that, I stamped on some random shapes like this thing here, this thing here, this, all these random shapes were stamped on. Mm -hmm. And I try to get some repetition when I'm stamping these random shapes. So you'll notice this shape over here above her shoulder and this shape right down here. And I, I don't think about where these stampings go. I don't think, oh, I want to avoid the figure or anything like that. I just start stamping. Mm. And by stamping, I mean, I take something, maybe some, sometimes I make my own stamps. I'll take a piece of uh, foam, a sheet of foam paper, and then mm -hmm. I'll take another sheet and cut pieces out and glue it onto that first sheet. And then I have a kind of a stamp, which I can roll paint over and then lay it onto the painting. So I get these big, because this painting is 36 by 36. So any stamping mm -hmm. that I do on there has to be fairly sizable. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, I, I want to get repetition in these shapes. So you'll notice here that you have the blue on white working up here in this right hand corner. And then here it's the same stamp, but it's light blue on dark blue. So I get non identical repetition going on in various places. This is the same stamp, but it's just dark blue against the kind of um, randomness of the background. And then once I get all these shapes on here, I, I take a look at it. I also stamped on some of these little cubes. I don't know why they don't really fit, um, but it felt like the right thing to do. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and this is acrylic? Yes, this is acrylic. This particular one, uh, I could really work it hard because I put it on a mahogany background instead of a mm -hmm. canvas. Mm -hmm. which gives you, you're, you're working with something that's not flexible. So you can really do a lot of stamping and pressing and scraping and you don't have to be so delicate. Mm -hmm. So um, then I kind of took a look at it and I thought, hmm, I don't have a good value pattern here. And this is one of those elements of design, right? Your value pattern. Mm -hmm. So the, the, I know that there are different formats for the elements and principles, but the one that I go with is line size, shape, direction, color, value, and texture. Mm -hmm. And um, I tend to work a lot with texture and color. And it's hard for me to be sure that I have a value pattern that has a good dominance of either light or dark. Mm -hmm. I tend to, my natural tendency is to go for 50%. 50%, everything always ends up 50-50, 50% dark, 50% light. And that's just not good. 50% does not work in a painting. There has to be a dominance, which is another one of those principles that mm -hmm. scales all the way through all sciences and psychology and everything else. And it's one that people don't like, but it's the whole hierarchy principle. It's the 80-20 mm -hmm. rule. It just has to be that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. Um, so I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, this is not good. I don't have a good value pattern and it's kind of wishy-washy. It doesn't really do anything for me. It kind of looks like wallpaper. Mm -hmm. So, so I started thinking, what can I do? So in my next step, I brought this chair in behind her shoulder to anchor her, give her a little dark here. Mm -hmm. I put this dark on her feet here. I put a little dark over here. I made this shape behind her dark so that I had this dark thing winding through here, kind of mm -hmm. hook her to the canvas a little bit. I tried putting a, a dark line out to the edge here to connect. It looks her much more like she's in a space now, yes. Yeah, connect her to the edges. Mm -hmm. And it's still, I'm looking at it and I, I just can't get a feel for where I need to go. So frequently what I do when something like this happens is I add more chaos mm -hmm. because more chaos gives me more to work with because you know all the information is in the chaos. All mm -hmm. the information is in the unknown. So if you need more information, you can add more unknown and then that gives you more information. Mm -hmm. And this is the way I've worked for years. So when I started hearing Jordan Peterson talk about this, mm -hmm. about how the new information is in the unknown, is in the chaos, I thought. I know exactly what you're talking about. So, um, so the next thing I did was I started thinking, well, what kind of chaos could I add? So I had been to this lovely place along the coast and they had a lot of flowers. And so I took a picture of the flowers and I overlaid this onto the flowers. And here's this paint, here's the photograph overlaid onto the flowers. And I looked at that for a while and I thought, you know, that's just too pretty. That's not the look I'm going for at all. So, And you were using this as just sort of a test, right? To see if yeah. you would appreciate yeah. flowers as a part of the canvas. Yeah, yeah. Now, mm -hmm. I didn't paint this on. This is just uh, using Photoshop or something right. to put two layers together. Right, right. And so I thought, well, I don't like that. So I found this old illustration and I thought, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. more interesting. Mm -hmm. So what happens if I overlay that old illustration onto the painting? Mm -hmm. So this is that illustration laid over the top. Mm 
Mm, much better. So I can still kind of see, you can just barely see the woman's face here. She's here and mm -hmm. the whirly thing moving through here, which I thought that had a lot of life to it. It really added mm -hmm. a lot of uh, impact. Mm -hmm. And there was this kind of white shape here. I didn't know what that was, but I thought that was kind of interesting. And so I just looked through and I think, what part of that could I use to add chaos to what I've already got going on here? So then I just start randomly adding in some of these marks to make kind of more chaos for myself. I see now I missed an opportunity because there was really something else going on here that would have been very cool in this painting. Hmm. Painting is already sold, so I can't do it now, but maybe I'll do it in another, in another work. So then what I came up with is this. Hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see this element right yeah. here comes from, comes from. Right, right. Here, right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yeah, then the whirly beautiful. thing comes through. I didn't, mm -hmm. I, I had it over her at one point, but then I mm -hmm. painted, painted through, painted her back in there. Mm -hmm. I, at one time point, I had it going all the way through like this, but I, then I painted her back in. Mm -hmm. And that little bauble over there, which originally was this little thing right here. I looked mm -hmm. at that and I thought, that mm -hmm. looks like the back side of a Japanese lady. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I painted the Japanese lady <laughs> right there. That's that little bauble. And then I just made her a little face and a little kimono. And where those light stripes came through, I left them on the back of the dress because it just seemed to make sense to me. And the other little baubles, I just- You're kind of fixing them. out for me. I yeah, I don't know what, I don't know why, but I just painted around them and left them there. They don't, they're not anything. These shapes in here, I thought were interesting. So I left them there and enhanced them a little bit. And I'm still looking at the value pattern and I'm thinking, you know, this light, I have some nice lights in here, but this light thing coming right down the middle of the painting, I, it just doesn't do it for me. Something's wrong there. Hmm. So, yeah. so I'm puzzling, what can I do? Every time I go back in, the other thing I do, every time I go back in and rest, restate the painting, I restate the boundaries, the edges here. I don't know if you can see. I come in sometimes with very hard edges in certain places and restate all these edges. If you go back like to here, there's hardly any edges going on here. But by the time I get to here, I'm starting to put these really hard edges in. I did have both legs as dark originally. I went back in and lightened this one so it wasn't such a, a strong dark right at the bottom of the frame. Um, I'm sorry, we keep, I, you, you keep freezing up. I'm not sure if it's you or me, but if I'm not responding, it's because we've suddenly gone rogue, so. Okay, well, we do but, what we can, yeah. I, you know, I used to always kind of stop whenever things would freeze up and then I thought, well, let's just wait it out and see how long it lasts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right, that's right. Well, I just meant if I wasn't responding to what you were yeah. saying, that was why. Yeah, so then, then I decided I want to get rid of that white thing. So I went in and I tried mm -hmm. just making it more colorful, lightening things up mm -hmm. with more color. And I thought, you know, no, I lost, I lost something there because we had, we had an anchor, we've lost something. So at the end, I decided to go in with a big, bold, dark here in this whole corner. Mm -hmm. So now I've got about 20, 25% dark here and the rest of this pretty much reads as light. So I have an L-shaped light here and I have this dark corner which, which serves as an anchor. Mm -hmm. and, and she has this little thing coming up around her shoulder that I kind of holds her in place, I think. Mm -hmm. So this was the finished piece. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. And there are some really lovely repetitive things. I, and I really appreciate the light coming in from the side here. I think the dark corner allows the light coming in from the side to help us read this as a real light source with light 
here on this space and spilling out over here behind. It's very interesting to see the way your stamping becomes something else. And so the stamping isn't for you something that you're doing to create a particular look, but more just to get those elements and principles into the piece and then intuitively to respond to them and let it become something else. Is that yeah. a good way of describing it? Yeah, yeah, it's way better than I could describe it, but yes, that's exactly it. <laughs> yeah, the, the stamping is more to provide me, um, I used to do watercolor. I don't know if you've ever painted with watercolor, mm -hmm. but watercolor creates what's called happy accidents. Mm, yes. And uh, that was one of the things I really liked because when I started painting, I thought I am not a creative person at all. Uh, all I know how to do is try to copy a picture. Mm. But after I'd worked with watercolor for a while, I realized that if you just kind of let it do its thing, mm. sometimes these wonderful yeah. things would happen and you could play with it and create something out of it. So I started getting a little bit more creative. Mm -hmm. But then when I switched to acrylic, acrylic is very intentional. Mm -hmm. You have to make every single choice. How am I going to change this color from light to dark? How am I going to mm -hmm. get more intensity here? Every choice is, mm -hmm. is, has to be intentional. And where you put it on the canvas has got to be very intentional. And that scared me because I didn't know how to make choices. Mm -hmm. So I started developing a process for myself that established a level of chaos that I had to fight against because if I had to fight against the chaos, mm -hmm. I had to kind of charge in there with courage and try to make choices amongst the, all of the elements that I saw there. And, and how did you come to that idea? I think that's very interesting. What made you decide I'm going to approach this from the perspective of chaos? Uh, that's an interesting question. I remember one painting in particular that goes back to um, maybe 20 years ago. I was in a mom's group and there was a woman in my small group mm -hmm. who had become a paraplegic from a car accident that she and her husband and baby had been in when the baby was 10 months old. Mm. Wow. And so the little girl was three at the time I met her. And she was a woman of such courage and grace. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I had taken some photographs of her, beautiful, beautiful woman. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to paint her with her little girl. I tried several different takes mm -hmm. on it. And I could never come up with anything I really liked because mm -hmm. to me, it's a big challenge to take a blank piece of paper and try to make something on it. and. I'm not really good at creating a likeness. I don't think I have a lot of skill for representational art. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had tried several things and, and I, I wanted to be able to give her something that was beautiful mm -hmm. and I didn't come up with anything that represented her courage and her strength. Mm -hmm. And then one day I was just kind of angry <laughs> at myself and I was looking through my drawer and there was an old painting of a um, a woman's face on a kind of active background and it was all in blues with a lot of lines and design in it. And I thought, well, maybe I'll just try painting over this. So I turned it upside down and then I superimposed her and her little girl on this crazy background. And I just started trying to find her in there. Hmm. And it was such an amazing experience. Huh. And I sort of felt like it was uh, kind of analogous to some kind of redemption hmm. where you take an old thing that you were going to throw out because it just wasn't working and then you find the beauty in it mm -hmm. and then it's, then it's something completely new. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, what if I just tried working like that all the time? Mm -hmm. If I don't have an old painting to paint over, what if I just make something that I paint over? Then nothing is so precious anymore because mm, right. we tend to make everything so precious. Like when I first started here, let's go back to number one. Obviously all the colors here are too hot. It's just like screaming at you. It, it's, 
it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't play nice. But this guy over in the corner here, there was something fascinating to me about that. Why did he show up there? And he was kind of cool looking, really. I mean, this mm -hmm. odd head with this very kind of cool light on his shoulder, and and I was it makes me think of it, an angelic being. Yeah, or something. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was tempted to think, well, I want to leave that in there because it's kind of precious and it's this little found mm -hmm. object. But one of the first things that I ever learned from the guy that taught me about creativity was you have to learn to give up the precious thing. Mm -hmm. That's, um, in fact, one of my favorite quotes from um, there's this TV series, a sci fi TV series I really like, Fringe. And uh, one of the characters in there talks a lot about how in chess, you have to be willing to give up the most precious player mm. in order to win. And so you have mm. to give up these precious things. So the first thing I did was paint this out because I knew otherwise I was gonna paint the whole painting trying to save him. Huh. And, and if I did that, I was gonna lose whatever else was supposed to be going on over here. So, mm. So yeah, so so it was kind of that experience of working with her painting that I think led me to, um, and I really loved what it, how it turned out mm -hmm. because it expressed something about her, mm -hmm. and it expressed something about my love for her, mm -hmm. and um, and and it all became visible in the painting, which wouldn't have been there if I had just been fighting over a blank canvas yet one more time trying to make a, a realistic version of her. Mm -hmm. And was it representational at the end? Was the portion that included her and her daughter representational or was it? I would say it daughter? looked enough like her to where mm -hmm. you can tell. Mm -hmm. I mean, when mm -hmm. I showed it to her, she said, oh, I want to buy this for my husband for our anniversary. Uh -huh. so, uh -huh. so, I mean, she felt and I felt that it was enough like her that, um, you know, I wouldn't say it was a perfect likeness by mm -hmm. anybody, yeah, but it right. kind of captured her. Mm -hmm. captured her mm -hmm. And uh, Mm -hmm. and yeah, so that is really interesting seeing the process that you went through and uh, how you used uh, Photoshop to sort of put your images together and decide what you liked. And then was that something you just came up with? Like, hey, this would be something I could. Sometimes I use Photoshop to check colors or to see what would happen if I adjust the background or to observe my values or something like that. But I haven't done what you've done here. And that is very interesting to consider. Well, let me show you, uh, I think, I think I can bring this up. No, that's not it. Hmm. Um, this is a series that I did way early, like probably 20, 20 years ago, I did this series of mothers and daughters. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, this was the second time I took the creativity class. And mm -hmm. here's where I got this idea about the elements and principles of design um, mm -hmm. was from this creativity teacher who, the way it was set up, that it was a 10 week class and every week you had to paint two large paintings, at least 22 mm -hmm. by 30. And you didn't do them in class, you did them at home and then you brought them in and then we would critique each other's work. Mm -hmm. First, he would do a lecture on one of the elements or principles. Mm -hmm. And then we would go home, we would paint using that element or principle specifically. Mm -hmm. And then we mm -hmm. would come back the next time with these two paintings and then we would mm -hmm. critique. So I took that class eight times, which is 160 paintings and I got those elements and wow. principles drilled into my brain. <laughs> um, so I think this one may have been when he was lecturing about line. Mm -hmm. As you can see, I use this kind of halo line running down through to connect the mother and child mm -hmm. so that these connections are made. Um, and then using the, the lavender and gold to play off mm -hmm. of each other mm -hmm. and make Kind of a bold choice of having the figures in red. Mm -hmm. um, but I had also gotten this idea from taking photographs on Photoshop. So this is when I first started working with Photoshop elements. You can reverse the photograph, almost like making a negative out of it, mm -hmm. and then play with the colors, run them from cool to warm and 
just see what shows up. And so I got this mm -hmm. idea of, of um, playing with this negative effect. And I did some other, this particular series, I'll go back to this in a minute, where I use, the other thing about his teaching is you had to take the exact form and re reproduce it 20 times, hmm. but in different ways. Hmm. So you see this, another one that I did with the same, here's the same mother and child in exactly mm -hmm. the same position. Mm -hmm. This one I did with um, aluminum foil glued to a background and then the paint washed over the aluminum foil. It's a real trick to paint and on is aluminum this, foil. <laughs> yeah, right. Is this the series that you were doing that you said you were really sort of wrestling through some things of, on your own and of your own? And as you were creating the paintings, you were, you were wrestling with your ideas and how did the paintings, doing the paintings help you with that aspect of what you were experiencing? I would say definitely that in this series, I was really trying to understand what it was to be a mother. Mm -hmm. Because I had my second, I had my first daughter when I was 21. I had my second daughter when I was 46. <laughs> wow, wow. So, so at the time I was painting these paintings, my daughter, what my daughter that I was born when I was 46 was probably six or seven years old by this time. Mm -hmm. And, um, when you have a little one running around the house, mm -hmm. you're just thinking, I mean, for me, I was thinking a lot about how I was God's little one and he mm -hmm. loved me in spite mm -hmm. of my messes and in spite yeah. of my mistakes and in spite of my falling down all the time and in spite mm -hmm. of my back talk and all of that, right? And, and I couldn't help but think about that because I had this little one and, and he was teaching me to love her the way that he loved me. And, and so that was all going through my mind when I was painting this series. But this one would have been where we were focusing on texture. Mm -hmm. This one would have been where we were focusing on, um, I don't know, maybe color. And how did the process of doing those, like was it something that happened where because you were thinking so much about mothers and daughters, it was somehow... Um, occurring to you in your painting sort of those ideas about how God loves you because I, I agree with you I think we learn more about how God loves us from the way we love our children than anything else in the world you know and then when we have more than one and we realize just a little bit of how God can love uh, all of us because you know when you have your, just your first child you think you're never going to be able to love somebody else like this although I imagine that probably is a little bit different when you're first daughter is what 26 then when you're 24 when the second one was born. wow wow yeah so that must be very different because you've been through all the, those um moments between mothers and daughters that are so full of anger <laughs> and passion <laughs> and drama and uh yes, you know, <laughs> yes we're so connected you know there's such a bond between mothers and daughters that it's so painful even the natural inclination of just our children our daughters in particular, I think moving into a new space is is an intensity that is a lot of um, learning and we have, there's so many lessons that come from that in particular. So I, it's interesting to think about, like, at, like I know sometimes if I'm working with color or with light or something, something will occur to me in the midst of the painting. And it happens also if I'm outside working in the garden sometimes, just there'll be some like aha moment that happens from, the process of, of doing it. Like I remember realizing that uh, some form of uh, red, blue, and yellow was gonna create skin tone, whether it was darker, lighter, red, blue, yellow, and white. And so white, you know, feeling like light. And I just thought that was fascinating that the three primary colors mixed in some variety would create all skin colors. And so that was, that was kind of fascinating to me. So like, as you were working through these, what, what were there things that were occurring to you as you went through that, that yeah, what you described before of sort of realizing that God was 
uh, teaching you to love your children as he loved you as you went through. Was that helped by the process of painting or was it more of the reflection time of working on the painting sort of gave you that processing with two different parts of your brain? Well, like I said, this was the second class I took with him. The first class I took with him, I took as my subject, the pianist. Hmm. And uh, on, hmm. it was the hands of the pianist on the piano. Huh. And one of his rules was that you could never, um, you could never complain about your work hmm. and you could never um, make excuses for your work. Hmm. So when hmm. you stood up with your work, you just had to set it up there and then just stand there and let it happen, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I was a pretty new painter at that time and I wasn't at all skilled and I knew I wasn't skilled and I was just learning and it was very hard for me to stand with my work when I knew full well what was wrong with it. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to stand up there and say, oh, I love this, you know, right, right. because I knew what was wrong with it. And I wanted to make sure everybody knew that I knew because if they didn't think I knew, they'd think I was a right. fool, right? Right, right? So I had all those fears and um, the first couple of paintings, I just painted hands on the keyboard, like very realistic. And then when I got to painting number four, I had a photograph of my daughter my daughter's piano teacher, her hands on the keyboard. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at the hands on the keyboard and one finger was pressed down on the keys. And I remember that the teacher had always said that it's the, it's the pressure and the placement of the finger on the key that brings mm -hmm. out the beauty. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow. And there's something about the tops of those hands that just look like mountains. Mm. So I began to paint the painting as though the hands were mountains mm -hmm. and with a sunrise behind and the keyboard mm -hmm. was a waterfall and mm -hmm. the water coming over the edge of the keyboard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had such a picture in my mind, it was gonna be so beautiful, right? <laughs> But I didn't know how to paint water and I didn't know how to paint mountains and I didn't know how to make a beautiful sky and I was trying to work in watercolor and it's difficult to work with and so I knew how I wanted it to look and it didn't look that way and mm -hmm. I had to stand up in front of the class with this painting and mm -hmm. not complain and not make excuses and keep my mouth shut and so I'm standing up there and all this pressure I just began to weep. <laughs> Tears were streaming down my face. Mm -hmm. I was so afraid of being humiliated and all these people looking at me. And I've been to many critiques where people cry. So for all different reasons, but that there is such an incredible sense of vulnerability in that moment. You know, you really you're putting a piece of yourself out there and it's so hard. It's like standing naked in the garden and yeah. realizing. Yeah. You know, but then I looked out at the group and they were crying. Mm -hmm. And I realized, you know, um, we, we, we don't always know what we're doing. Yeah. We never know what we're doing really. But, but if we just move ahead and do it, that the Lord can do something with even the weakest offering that we know how to make. And yeah. And he did something with that painting that touched so many people just yeah. because they asked me what it meant. And I was able to tell them what it meant, mm -hmm. that, that it's, it's the pressure and the placement of what God does in our lives that brings the beauty out of our lives. It, mm -hmm. It's that moment of pain or sorrow or struggle that brings the beauty out and, um, mm -hmm. and that opened me up from then on to the fear didn't go away the fear never went away the sense of being humiliated never went away but what did happen is i had more courage to move ahead into the fear mm -hmm. and just do the work whether i felt that my skill level was there or not mm -hmm. and so in some of these paintings this is the second series i look at it now and i think you know, I kind of cringe because the skill level is just not there. And yet there is something there. Mm 
And so I'll give it what it, I'll, I'll give it its due. There's something there. God gave me something to put some paint on a piece of paper and I did it and there's something there. And mm -hmm. almost all of these sold, there were people who found something meaningful in them. And so you just have to do what you do and let God take care of the rest. And so I think that's what I learned from doing this series. So it had something in it for you, but also something in it for people who saw them and then wanted to make them their own so that they could respond in the same, in their own way. That might be different yeah. than yours. Yeah. 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 How was the process of redoing the same? So you had an image you were working with. Is that what it was? Yeah, and I then you were recreating had, the image? I had a photograph and, mm -hmm. and it, was, it was of a woman with her child. It was actually at a luau in... Hawaii. <laughs> I was at another table and this woman was sitting there showing some food to her daughter. That's all it was. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but because we had to use the same image in every painting, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and the reason for that, here's the reason for that, because it puts a very stiff constraint on your work. Mm -hmm. you're, you're bounded. You're very much bounded. But it's a good thing to be bounded because if you make a matrix of line size, shape, direction, color, value, and texture, and then spread it out with all of the principles, which mm -hmm. are unity, harmony, contrast, dominance, repetition, gradation, variation, and balance. Now you have a matrix of 56, mm -hmm. but every one of them has a gradation from zero to infinity. Mm -hmm. So you really have an infinite number of choices with every brush stroke. So it's really important to constrain yourself as much as possible. So once you constrain yourself to this same image, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, after you've painted it exactly the way it was two or three times, it's like, okay, now what else can I do with it? Mm -hmm. Can I focus on color? Can I focus on line? Um, you know, can I focus on the relationship between the two, what, what can I do with it? So I'll just fire through these really quickly. This one here, I've tried to focus on getting it, getting an illumination to come off of the page. Mm -hmm. So the way that you get illumination to happen is you keep your values very, very close. And then you have complementary colors with, um, and you just have this little bit of light next to you see, this is almost gray here. Mm -hmm. And when you bring this down to almost gray and then you put the, the very intense color next to it, it'll just shine right off the piece of paper. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was focusing on there. This one I was focusing on just complementary colors. And um, I really love this one. <laughs> You know, it's, it's kind of pretty because it's all pink and everything. So it really should go in some baby's room. This one I still have. This is one of the only ones that never sold because it's, it's so very delicate. But, mm. but I, I really feel the relationship between these two. Then this one, um, I was trying to get a more modern design that was just kind of more abstract and just sh about the shapes really focusing on the shapes mm. and trying to tie the two together with the colors being very close. Hmm. Yeah. This one was just uh, a sketch. I guess that was a different series. Oh, this one, I wanted to get this light running right through both of them, coming right down the middle like that. Um, and then this one, I flipped it so they're looking this direction instead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I made a wild and crazy background. And then I just went in with a little white and carved her out, carved huh. her out of the wild and crazy background so that it would look more like an abstract. You'd have to look at it for a minute to see them. So this is a little bit like the process that you were describing when we first began, where you put yeah. something down and then covered it over with something else. Yeah. yeah. So I think I think that learning that process was a long process. So this is going back 20 years mm -hmm. and developing the fullness of that process. I didn't probably get there for until like five years ago or something like that, where I really dug into mm -hmm. the fullness of that process. Now, um, can you can you say more? I'm still.
still interested. I'm not quite grasping about the elements being in everything. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Like how, how that on another level, how that relates to your view of the world or your view of God or the universe or the spiritual world or whatever it is. I don't want to put words in your mouth. So, well, it's, um, that's such a huge topic. So I'm just going to take like one thing, for example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, let's just take the issue of constraints. Mm -hmm. I, I think that constraints enable creativity and, um, there's nothing new there. It's a cliche. Mm -hmm. Necessity is the mother of invention, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, that's the thing about cliches. Cliches are cliches because they're so deeply true that we can just say the cliche and immediately all this deep truth populates out through everything mm -hmm. that we think about. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> Another thing is that if you take all of the elements and principles of design, it gets really overwhelming. So if you're trying to work with that in your head all the time, you just go mm -hmm. crazy. You can't paint that way. So you mm -hmm. just have to paint and then you can step back once in a while and look at it and assess it through that lens. Then you can go back in and paint some more and then come back out. And so when you're actually painting, you can't be thinking about those things. Mm -hmm. So you're not pre-planning it. You're doing it intuitively and then looking for what is there. And yeah, and looking for what, maybe what it needs. Maybe mm -hmm. maybe in some situation, um, here's, here's a good thing. The 80-20 thing is very, very important, right? So when you're thinking about one of the elements, let's say value, you have to think about there being a dominant value and then a subdominant value. And so maybe maybe you have 80% of your painting is a mid range and 15% of it is dark and 5% of it is light. So you have this big papa and then you have a mama and then a baby and the baby is the, you know, like 5%. Mm. That's where your focus is gonna go. Well, that's true, whether it's value or whether it's line or texture or anything else. You can't have a painting that's 100% texture, mm -hmm. except maybe Jackson Pollock can do that. I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you have to have some, even in a painting that has a lot of action going on, there have to be some resting places. And so you have to have, like this painting, I would say is 80% with a lot of action going on. And then there's just this little bit of plain white happening there that gives it a little bit of a resting space hmm. but the 80 20 thing happens everywhere um so here i was trying to get mostly red with just a little bit hmm. of green it's always a challenge for me not to end up with 50 50. Hmm. But the reason that's important is that one of the principles is dominance mm -hmm. so i said before that's an unpopular principle but it's just so true um that you have to have dominance for things to be properly ordered. Mm -hmm. And it's not um, always 80 20 ratio, but yeah, that's true. That's interesting to think yeah, of. It's not always going to be an 80 20 ratio, but mm -hmm. even in a marriage, okay? Mm -hmm. Marriage, you can say, well, we have a 50 50 partnership. Well, maybe, but each of you is going to be more, way more than 50. In, I mean, obviously the best marriages are 120, 120, but then <laughs> it doesn't work out with the numbers, right? Uh -huh. um, but if you have a business partnership, it's almost death to a business partnership to have a 50-50 partnership because there's no decision maker. Mm -hmm. So maybe you have a partnership where one has 51, the other one has 49. Maybe you can make that work because then at least there's somebody who's a decision maker. Mm -hmm. But that I think that principle of dominance, when you look at it, it kind of scales through every scientific endeavor as well. There mm -hmm. has to be there has to be a decision maker in every well that that for me to drag that up right now is a little bit difficult, but um, I have a bunch of stuff written on it, but 
let me just simplify it down to think of it this way. If you take all the elements and principles of design and simplify them down to a, a little small matrix, you would get unity with variety within constraints. And that is, you see that in um, calculus, you see that in physics, you see that all over the world, the one and the many. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very important principle of the way the world works. Value, I think, is important, not just in the issue of how much you have of what, but there is something about value that value in a painting is dark and light, right? Mm -hmm. But that's true in moral situations too. That's true in theology. That's true in philosophy. It's true in science mm -hmm. that you have a scale of dark to light. You have mm -hmm. it in, in so you have this binary, this polar polarity. Mm -hmm. And um, so what we learn from value in art is that there's an order of seeing. Mm -hmm. So when, you're, when you go into a museum, the thing that draws your eye first is the value contrast. Mm -hmm. So if there are paintings that don't have much value contrast, they're not going to draw your eye as fast as the one that has a strong value contrast. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. And um, I tend to be more of a color person rather than a value person. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to do that, then you have to um, you have to find a way to really make your color sing in order to make your painting something that people are going to notice right away. Mm -hmm because they're gonna notice the value paintings. And if you go into a museum and you see like a Rembrandt, you see these big bold darks and just this little bit of light coming in there and it, you know, so um, value is the, in the order of seeing value is first. And then after that is pattern. Mm -hmm. So I tend to like to use a lot of pattern in my work. So pattern will also catch people's eyes. And then after pattern is color. So color only comes third in the order of seeing. And I think that's- now, do, you, do you think different people will respond to different things when they look at work? Because I have found that to be the case. Not everyone responds to the same thing. So for one person, it might be dominance value. It might be uh, the color, it might be the pattern, it might be the repetition. But I think there's a little bit of a difference in how we're all drawn to something, either because of the content of the image or because of the way it's put together or something else too. Well, that's probably true once you look at the painting, but mm -hmm. what gets you over there? When, you're, when you walk into a museum, what gets you from one end of the room to the other to a particular painting? And what they, I mean, this is just what the researchers say, that's what the the uh, creativity teacher told me is that the thing that draws people initially is the value contrast. Now, you know how it is when you, when you first meet somebody and then you fall in love with them later, you know, maybe what you fall in love with them for is not what drew you to them in the beginning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. Because then you begin to see some subtleties, you begin to see some other things happening in them that you really, really like. But in the beginning, you were drawn to them for a particular reason. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe he's tall or he's got dark hair or I like his smile or whatever, you know. And later on, you learn more. But I think mm -hmm. it's the same thing with a painting. Mm -hmm. um, but supposedly, if a painting doesn't have, for example, when I used to submit paintings to shows, the, the uh, coaches would always say, if you want your painting to be noticed when they're flipping, you know, they flip through a thousand slides to get 50 slides that they're going to take for the show. Mm -hmm. They're going to flip fast. And if mm -hmm. you don't have a strong value pattern, they're going to flip right past your painting. Hmm. That's an interesting thought. And so I, after a while, I quit submitting to shows because value pattern is not my thing. Mm. I can do it, but it's, I don't enjoy it as much as I do working with close colors. Mm -hmm, mm hmm. Yeah, well, certainly you were in good company with the impressionists who are so often working with close colors mm -hmm. and not always strong darks or lights. So I'm thinking of even some of like Surratt's, you know, the giant painting and that there there isn't a 
huge range of value. So maybe in different time periods too, but very interesting thing to think of what draws you to a piece when you're seeing it from far away. That's an interesting idea. I'll have to think about that next time I'm in a gallery or museum. Well, let's, let's just for fun, let's look up. Is it Le Grand Jat? Your French is much better than mine. I, uh, I, I can't quite remember if that's what it's called, but it's, yeah. Now see, he does have a, he does have a strong value pattern. It may not be a strong contrast, but you see this shape right here? I'm not seeing it. Well, squint and you see this shape along no, the bottom. I mean, I'm not seeing the painting. I still see oh. you. So you're not seeing the painting. Sharing is pause. Bring your shared window to the front. Oh, because I was sharing from a different window. I'm going to stop share here and then I'm going to go back and bring up this other window. Learn something new every day on this thing. <laughs> um, Sunday on the Grand Jot. Sure. Okay. So now you see? Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. There's this line mm -hmm. makes this. The other thing that's supposed to be really important is a very strong shape. You get mm -hmm. a strong shape, you get people's eyes. See this mm -hmm. line right here, this big chunk down at the bottom. And then there's a big chunk at the top. So if you squint, you're going to see these big dark shapes. And then this light area in the middle with all the little dark shapes in it. Mm -hmm. So he really has a very um, strong value pattern, but it also borders on a more of an abstract value pattern because the abstract value patterns are spit spot mixed up all, all over the whole canvas rather than large shapes here and there. So he has a kind of a little bit of each. Mm. He's played with he's played with the figures and their shadows and the figures and their shadows and uh, the umbrella and these big dark shapes. I love There's it. There's certainly a lot of pattern in it too. Yes, it's interesting that you used that term value pattern. I haven't heard those uh, those two combined as a single element before. So um, that's an interesting way to consider it. Well, I the the teachers that I've learned from in art workshops out here almost always use that terminology. So maybe it's just something they cooked up amongst themselves. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, value and pattern I've heard. I just haven't heard the, them together. So mm -hmm. interesting idea. You gave me something to think about in uh, considering the way, because you certainly do see pattern occurring with value in this painting and in the ones that you showed us of your work as well. So that's very interesting. Well, I worked with a, an artist a number of years ago. Can't think of her name right now, but um, she got fairly well known in this area and she wrote one of these art books and sold quite a few copies and she did workshops and classes and uh, her thing was that value is very, very important in a painting to have a, a, mm -hmm. a striking value pattern, but it's also mm -hmm. not a natural kind of gift that we have to be able to see the value pattern. Hmm. So there's, there's different approaches to finding a value pattern. Her approach was build lots of little black and white maquette value patterns, little, little thumbnails on your page, just doodle and make value patterns and try to come up with interesting value patterns that catch your eye. Mm -hmm. Now pick one of those value patterns that you really like and superimpose it over the top of your drawing that you want to do and just mm -hmm. arbitrarily choose to make this part dark and that part light. Even if the light's coming from this side and there's a highlight there and it shouldn't mm -hmm. be that way, you arbitrarily mm -hmm. impose this dark and light over the top of your picture. Mm -hmm. And then when you do that, very interesting things happen. Uh -huh. Very, very interesting things happen. Mm -hmm. um, I've had other artists that solve the problem in other ways. They just find a photograph that has a value pattern that they like, and then they'll trace the value pattern from the photograph. 
Hmm. And then maybe they'll superimpose that photograph's value pattern onto their own painting, hmm. even if it's different subjects. Hmm. Because what you want to do, you want to get, um, there's something about noise. In, in the first episode I ever did on this show, I was talking to a guy who's a geologist from Illinois. Mm -hmm. And he said, there's a thing called stochastic resonance, which is a kind of a random noise. Hmm. And when um, sound engineers are given uh, a sound sample where they can't clearly tell what the people are saying, you know, like maybe you have a, you have an FBI tape or something and they can't quite make out what the guy is saying. Mm -hmm. If they superimpose a white noise sample onto that sample, there's a place where this random noise will connect up, the signals of the random noise mm -hmm. will connect up with the signals mm -hmm. of the other noise and just amp amp the signal in certain places enough to where now they'll be able to hear the, what the people say. Huh. Huh. And I think that's that that struck me as being exactly the same principle as what I'm working with here. Hmm. If I interpose an extra bit of noise, it'll amp the signal for me so I can see more clearly. Because you know how it is when you want to do a painting, you have an image in mind, but you can't, it's like a dream. You can't quite get there you can't quite see what it is that's in your head but once you see it that's why I use I play with Photoshop because if I play enough with stuff I can finally see it I think oh yes that's exactly what I'm going for mm -hmm. but if I can't see it then I I'm just struggling all the time trying to get there mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's a crutch I mean absolutely it's a crutch there's no question about that it's not I know that there are wonderful painters who can just sit down and paint a masterpiece without a crutch, but me, I need a crutch, so. <laughs> well, there's all different processes, you know, we're all created differently and we all have different gifts and different ways of approaching it and different results with our paintings. So um, the work that I do is very different than the work that you do and my process is very different too. So it's interesting to think of how um, how that happens, you know, and Can how you we're- Can show us one of your paintings and talk about the process? Um, I can, I can show you one that I think is probably um, apropos for these time periods. Um, let me see if I can share my screen here. All right, so I have, um, my work is very representational. So can you see it okay? Yes, I can. Okay, so I am, um, I have a series of these and they're, these are very large too. I think, uh, I mean, the largest one I have is five feet by six feet. I think this one is uh, 24 by 36. I think that's the size of it. So I have, um, I think I have the first one I did. Um, the first, I, what this isn't the first one, I'm sorry. This is one of the early ones that I did um, and then they've I kind of continued to go on from there. This is another one uh, when I, when this one was delivered to the client's house, which was also like 24 by 36, but she had a very large wall and wanted something a little bit uh, bigger. So I ended up painting these <laughs> side panels to extend it a little so that the effect of it was um, larger than what. See, you have, you have a beautiful dominance there, right? Mm, yes, right, and strong contrast too, yeah. right? Yeah. Dark to light, and I feel like color is color is my um, is sort of my favorite element to work with. But as you said, in conjunction with everything else, I'm just I really I love color. I feel like I have sort of have a natural affinity for things that will go together in ways that they'll work, and it's sort of my first, my earliest memories of um, noticing things that were aesthetically pleasing have to do with color, you know, uh, the underside of poplar leaves against the stormy sky when I was walking home as a kid on a windy day or the, like the white rocks in my grandparents garden with the brown dirt and the evergreen. I mean, I think I must have been 
five years old that I can remember, like just really being struck by it. So that's something that's always been a part of me. But the the Ice Cube series, I kind of started as a, um, I was very resistant actually. Someone had suggested, because I was working on these glass paintings and the glass paintings uh, were kind of all about relationships and how we um, can, our perceptions can be a little warped because of how we see things through filters and how we um, see things as they're related to other people and other circumstances and everybody is shaped by their background and their, uh, you know, wounds and their um, joys. And so all, I was kind of doing that and somebody, and I had a whole lot of the glass paintings and then somebody suggested I try ice. And at first I was very resistant because I didn't want to do something from a photograph because I would rather paint from life if I could paint from life. Um, but I thought, you know, all right, well, I, I started to try one and I did one and I kind of liked how it turned out. And a lot of people seemed to be responding to it. So then as I was painting it though, what that thing that we were talking about, about like um, you do something because you kind of feel called to it or somebody you know brings it up and it's a, a suggestion and then you're working on it. And as I was working on it, I just realized it was all about transition and change. And it was all, all about like moving from one place into another place. And at the time I was well aware of my aging and thinking about how that all, uh, you know, how I was no longer what I used to be, but moving into another space and kind of thinking about inhabiting that new space and at the same time changing into something else. Um, well, can I go back, go back to that one for a second. I want to tell you something. This one or the glass one? The glass one. That one? Yeah when you yeah. were talking about this having to do with relationships and everything it made me think about the, I, I get a daily meditation from a guy who's a stoic and mm. he's been talking a lot about Marcus Aurelius and mm. Marcus Aurelius was chosen to be raised up to become the emperor mm. even though he had no background for it and he had to learn how to do it and he was terrified mm. um, totally you know, the imposter syndrome all over the place. Like, I can't do that. I don't know how to do any of that. But then he had a dream. And in his dream, he had I shoulders made of ivory. And that dream said to him, you can do this. You can do this. You just, you just need, you know, do the right thing, do the next right thing, but you can do this. You have shoulders of ivory. And that's, that's what this made me think of when I looked at this, because these look like so much like shoulders. I'm sure you were thinking about that when you were painting it, that these are these are the people in the relationships here. It's not just the relationships between these objects, but these are people. And it's how they're reflected into this light over here. And you see their relationships in a completely different way in the reflection than, than what they are in the in the in the reality if that is the reality and uh, anyway the shoulders of ivory <clears throat> made me think mm. of that yeah that's great i like that yeah so again my process is very different i sort of make my discoveries as i go through as you do but from a, a different point of view so the, these have i ha have revealed so much to me the ice paintings have been a wonderful um discovery about what it means to be in a place of transition and change and shift and i feel like it sort of prepared me a little bit for what is happening with um the past year and you know i think we're in a place of shift and transition and as you and i spoke about uh the last time we talked i think um we're all in a place of change. Something's on the horizon. We're moving into a new, um, a new state of being, whatever that means. And, you know, I don't know if that, I don't know what that means, but I feel like um, this is helping me be at peace with that. And so that is a good thing. It's been, it's been really helpful for me. So, so I also- What did you learn about transition by painting by painting your ice series. <clears throat> that it's kind of a, you know, that it's okay, that it's not, I mean, thinking about the ice sort of disappearing, 
and uh, no longer being what it was before in its solidity and its strength and its opportunity for, um, you know, having such substance. And, and then it begins to dissolve, but it, uh, it morphs into a new thing in the water, but it still reflects what was there before. And it's not lost, it's just changing. And, and it also, as it um, morphs or changes, it kind of reflects all of its experience around it in ways that it wasn't able to when it was strong and solid and not uh, having that, that moisture that reflects the light and reflects the other things that are there. And even when the water evaporates, it's still there. It's just in another state. And so it's just, it's just been a somehow a, like a, a very reassuring thing to me. And, and I like the colors. I like experimenting with different colors and thinking of ways, uh, you know, like you said, trying different things. So I'm going to put a little more red here. I'm going to put a little more orange. I'm going to do a little bit more of this or this, or do I like the blue against it? Do I like the yellow? So I start with photos I take and then I, uh, because obviously you can't paint, you know, ice quickly. <laughs> I can't paint it fast enough, especially doing it this large. So that's- So there's um, a couple of things I'd like to say about this painting. Mm, that, please. Um, one of the things that I talk about a lot is boundaries and mm. boundaries mm. also constraints, limitations, edges. Those are all part of the idea of boundaries. Mm -hmm. Your first boundary is your substrate here. You have this 24 by 36 inches. That's all you have to work with. And, mm -hmm. and, and you want your viewer to think there's something outside of here, but you also want to constrain the image. So, mm -hmm. so this is your first boundary. Now you have another boundary right here in the in the whole object here. You have I don't see your I can't see your pointer. Oh sorry. Well, okay. Look look at your, your ice in the center there. You mm -hmm. have yeah, okay. So you have a boundary there. And mm -hmm. at the on, on the top edge, it's a much sharper edge, a, a more defined edge between the ice and the, the background color. At the bottom mm. edge, it's very subtle, very soft, mm. kind of lost mm -hmm. and found edge almost all the way around the bottom. And that allows the viewer to move through that area and get to the place where you really want them to look, which I think mm -hmm. is the right hand corner of the ice cube where it touches the table. Mm -hmm. You have a little spot of white mm -hmm. next to the very, very dark where the water is melting into the table. And so you have your lightest light and your darkest dark right there. Mm -hmm. And from the left, coming into the painting, there is a tiny white line coming through that dark, that that's there to make sure that you get led right into the center mm -hmm. of the painting where you wanna be, mm -hmm. so that you can enjoy all these delicious colors in the center where the ice cube is. Mm -hmm. And um, and I love the edge that's between the the cube and the reflection of the cube, because there's all sorts of interesting stuff happening at that edge, mm -hmm. which is a really interesting thing scientifically about boundaries. Um, mm -hmm. Botanists say that if you have two fields that are growing two different kinds of things naturally, that at the edge between the two fields, mm -hmm. that kind of boundary between the, I don't mean field isn't the right word because these are not agriculturally sown fields, but just natural habitats. Mm -hmm. At the edge between the two habitats, there's incredible amount of creativity going on, new and different kinds of flora huh. and fauna thrive huh. in that arena. And so that's kind of what I see here in the, in the edge between the, the frozen cube and, the, mel and the, the reflection of the cube that boundary is filled with all kinds of variety. There's just all kinds of variety in there. And that's just really fascinating. Mm. And, and also the way the dark bleeds up and down from that central anchor there. It's very, mm. very interesting. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that was great. Thank you. That, it is really good to hear other people talk about your work. It can be very helpful and enlightening to see something else that's going on. Yeah. So well, your, uh, what is your process? How do you start a piece? Um, I take a lot of photos, stare at a lot of ice, watch the way it melts and the way the light hits it. Um, I've discovered all kinds of things. Like it's almost impossible to make um, clear ice in your freezer at home. <laughs> you have to get clear ice from uh, restaurants. There's a special process. I've tried distilled water and um, you know all kinds of water to get clear ice. And then I sort of thought I liked the cloudiness of it. I liked a little bit of obscurity and and mystery. But I do have you know like this one is the the clear ice. So I do have the clear ice as well. Um, so oftentimes if I'm out, I bring uh, you know cups of frozen. Uh, clear ice cubes home with me so I can photo them later and work with them. But basically I just, it's a very meditative process for me. Um, once I know what I'm going to do, once I have an image that I like, I set it up and I um, just begin to paint. And oftentimes I um, listen to lectures, things that I'm interested in, a lot of Jordan Peterson um, or other uh, things like that and kind of let my um, left and right brain be occupied in different ways as I'm working and then I'll just take some more time and stare at the painting and look at it and see it and I keep it in a space where I can see it as it's in process so that um, things that occur to me as I'm not looking at it directly can happen. So I do, I, I almost have to leave, but the other thing that I'm very interested in is uh, sort of everyday objects and how we can um, sort of appreciate what God is doing in, in the everyday world. So I have, like, I've got um, tomatoes and, mm. and these are big. Too. The tomatoes are, I think that, that one's 30 by 30 and this one's 36 by 48. So just kind of thinking about, um, you know, things that are around us all the time that are so easy to overlook in the world that we live in. And yet they're so amazing and miraculous. And the way the light moves through them again can just be so beautiful. So you're, I do- You're a color master. You're an absolute mm. color master. Mm. Thank you. I really do love color. I just, I am fascinated by it and fascinated by how it works. I feel like there's so much to know about it that I don't know that I'm always learning, you know, it's just fun to, um, it's, it's such an enjoyable process to, to work on it. And I hope I have a lot of years left because there's a lot I want to continue to study and learn. Now, are you so using would, oil? I'm sorry? Oil? These are all oil. Yep. Yeah, they're all oil on canvas. Um, so I, I, I love talking to you and I'm sorry to have to get off, but well, I do okay. have to get off. Yeah, I understand it's a lot later for you where you're at. So this has okay. been great. And, uh, and if we, do you want to stop share so we can yes. say our goodbyes with the full screen? That's a great idea, yes. Um, I know that one of the things that you wanted to talk about at some point was the possibility of getting more artists involved. So, mm. so if there are any artists out there watching, mm. if you would make some comments in the comment section about whether or not you'd be interested in having conversations with either myself or Sherry, that would be really helpful. That'd be great. And, and if you get a chance, you could like the like button and click subscribe and all that stuff so that we could have more viewers. That would be great. I hit 600 today. So that was like amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that is very exciting. Yeah. Yes, I know. I really am interested. One of the um, things that I spoke with Paul about this morning is I really, I would like to hear sort of how the spirit is moving in and between the the work that we're doing. And so I'm, I'm really, I feel, I mean, we didn't get into too much of a discussion about that. And, uh, you know, we can do it another time on or off camera if you want to, but I'm really interested in how um, the arts fit into the life of faith and what it means and what God is doing with, um, with that gift and uh, people who look and think that way. So I'm very interested in talking about that more um, as a part of the conversation about the art to marry them and discuss them more. Um, 
so if you want to, can you, do you want to link to both of our websites in the comments? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. Note, you can note. email me your email me anything that you want in the description section and I'll put it in. And also, um, I did a, an interview with Mary Cohen on her YouTube channel about the elements and principles where I went into it in detail when it was more clear in my mind. And I'll link to that as well okay. in the description section for anybody who wants more information. And of course, yeah. I just barely touched on it there because I've got hundreds of pages of stuff written about it. So, mm -hmm. but it's, some of it's so complex that I, because it's tied into so many different things, I can't always grab it from my mind when I need it. So I apologize. I think you did great. You you do a remarkable job talking to all the different people you speak with about <laughs> all the subjects that you talk about. So. Um, well, it's because I have time to get ramped up before we start, so I kind of know where we're headed, and I, I can be in the zone there. And yeah. I wasn't really prepared today to go too much into the weeds. So, well, you did so, great. Thank you for you did great interviewing me too. I thought that was wonderful. Yeah, and it and it's always fun to talk about my own work. And uh, I only showed some of my much older work. It would be fun to show some of my more recent work at some point. Um, yes, I would love that. Yeah. I would love to hear that and see that. That would be great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jay. Have a great again. weekend. Yeah. Thank you. You too, Karen. Bye-bye. <laughs>